Sometimes there are graphics cards that really aren't too bad, but imagine a company in recent history selling you a graphics card at the time which contained a measly 8 megabytes of VRAM and worse specs to boot. So this here is actually a 3D Phantom graphics card, one that seems to be probably the worst excuse for a graphics card that I've ever seen, and I've managed to get one brand new. You wouldn't tell it's brand new because the box is more or less destroyed. When you look at this, you probably think early 90s, but no, this one, this one's even worse than the last 3D Phantom graphics card we looked at, and I'd probably recommend people to watch that video, but in case you just want to see what this one is, this one sold at the end of 2005. It recommends the Pentium 4, Windows XP, and my favourite feature on the back, support goes as far back as Windows 95. I mean, you can ignore all of this amazing stuff they've got in here, such as... I don't think it can do half of these. I mean, it says it can do tri triangles. Uh, it also says it's got DirectX 8 support. That's probably a lie. I doubt it can do DVD playback. Most of these can't. What do you actually get inside the box of your new 3D Phantom XP2800? So, let's get this thing open. I don't... that opens there. Oh, the box is just really broken. Okay, there we go. And what do we get? Well, it's brand new. That is the sorriest excuse of a graphics card I've ever seen. I give you the 3D Phantom. This may actually be the worst looking excuse of a graphics card I've ever seen. 8 megabytes of VRAM in uh, 2005. It does actually have a user manual, which uh, tells us not much. I mean, it, it is, this, is, this is really basic. They say it sells with up to 16 BM of memory. Uh, we've only got 8 BMs of memory. Thank you for purchasing our XP3800 3D acceleration graphics card based on the SIS305. It supports DVD decompression, TV output, doesn't do either of those, 2D acceleration, and VCD playback. It supports the Intel Pentium 4. Y you never want to see that. They're, you know, they're not being entirely honest, but then again, did we ever expect them to be? Uh, and then, of course, for those that don't know, 3D Phantom, owned by Pine, would later go on to be XFX, who most people have probably actually heard of. And then we've got 1.7 Beta, the 3D Phantom install disk. So, let's get a PC together and find out if this thing turns on. These are... Uh, we're not in for a good time here, but... Let's find out if this one actually works, because this just looks abysmal. I reckon if we test this with this here HP Compaq, which we seem to use for testing anything AGP now, because it's got a ridiculously fast AMD Athlon in it, and at the moment, a Radeon VE, which is uh, another card so terrible it will get a video at some point, but that's not the point of today. More importantly, 3D Phantom, and now crucially, does it actually turn on? Yeah, there's a signal. It even comes up with SIS, which means you're in for a terrible time. It just looks like a bad signal. Well, it looks awful. This should now read this disc. I don't think it wants to read its own driver disc. Oh, no, it doesn't. My documents, 3D Phantom. One of these should be the setup file. Okay, this is good. These drivers were a bit of a pain to find. You know it's a quality installer when it when it looks like this. This is this is very bare bones. And now if we restart, we've made it back to Windows now. The, the output quality is still terrible. Can we do 1280 by 1024? No. The specs don't lie, it's terrible. Can we do 1024 by 768? No. This thing... Oh, oh we can. Okay, 1024 by 768. Oh, we'll take that. That's, that's not a bad resolution. Right, well it works, so let's carry on with whatever we can do with this hideous example of a graphics card. Now, while I get a few things tested and ready, if you want some real history on just what even is a 3D Phantom graphics card, I do have a video out there uncovering how they came to be, their weird obsession with Mao Zedong quotes on their website, and their questionable sales strategies that's still up there for you to watch. But this model here has served as their longest selling model, retailing from 2003 all the way through till 2008. That's right, you could buy this thing 
till 2008. It, it doesn't make any sense, but they did sell it. And who knows why they still existed or why they were still selling them. Maybe it's because they couldn't sell them and they just had them left in stock, or because they were selling so many of them they couldn't bring themselves to take it off the market just yet. The mystery of this card is one that only Pine and their 3D Phantom brand could answer, and I don't think they're ever going to do that. Thing is though, these parts are so awful compared to even integrated graphics from 20 plus years ago that the only real way to understand just how bad this graphics card actually is, is to look at the specs. Specifications wise, the 3D Phantom 2800 XP doesn't really deserve the title of graphics card. Despite the egregious amount of lies on the box, this thing hardly qualifies for anything other than to inflict suffering on its users, especially if you went out and bought one of these from their main retail year of 2005. Despite being a dedicated graphics card, the assumption can only be that these were some SIS chips that were so poor most board partners refused to even comprehend the idea of selling them, but not the lads over at 3D Phantom. Nope, they paired these with just 8 megabytes of SD RAM. Now keep in mind, most SIS 305 based ch cards and chips tended to retail with about 64 megabytes of sometimes even speedier RAM. So the idea here that they'd sell it to you with just 8 megabytes is ridiculous. It also runs at a cut down speed of AGP 2 times rather than the 4 times a lot of the competitors were using, and other than that, it features. I don't even know how to explain the features. Its feature set is one. It doesn't matter what it is, but you've got one of it, which is a pixel pipeline, shaders, yeah, it, it, it does one thing. That's it. It claims to support either DirectX 8 or DirectX 7, depending on where you look on the manual or box, but in reality, you'll have a hard time trying to make this thing do more than DirectX 6 with broken features, or very early versions of OpenGL with terrible performance. They retail now for virtually nothing, and are sold for about £20 to £40, depending on who you buy them off now, or who you bought them off back in the day. The prices for these things just haven't changed. And all the while you've been hearing this, I've been trying to get this thing set up to do some benchmarks, because the thing is... This is meant to be a display adapter at its worst, I guess, and it just loves to drop out at the slightest sign of doing anything remotely intensive. Trying to even do frame rate capture could be a nightmare, depending on how intensive the title was, because some of the more intensive titles that exist from when this card launched would crash if you tried to run fraps with them, causing a mountain of errors that I've never even seen fraps capable of churning out. I've even had to do some lossless capturing just to get you frame rate figures in certain titles, because that's just how dedicated I am to testing the world of 3D Phantom graphics cards. Seriously, benchmarking this has been painful to get any figures together. Not just trying to launch the games, but just trying to get a figure that's actually understandable out of them. So join me for some of the most questionable performance you will ever see from a mid-2000s. I really want to do stress that. This is a 2005 graphics card. It even says it as the manufacture date on the card itself. So that's when it was from, and we're going to see how it performs in the benchmarks. Starting off the benchmarks, we had Half-Life 1. I know starting things off with a late 90s title on a mid-2000s graphics card seems like madness, but remember, this thing is based on an SAS 305, which technically was actually being benchmarked with Half-Life 1 back in the day. But even so, we had to run things using such an abysmally low resolution, it was painful to actually set it, as the card would crash when changing either the renderer or the resolution as it would go over the tiny VRAM buffer that's available, and then it's trying to communicate with system RAM over AGP two times. That doesn't go very well. Systems don't like that, Windows XP is not fond of it. Eventually though, with enough sort of low settings plumbed in, we did actually see the game run at mostly over 60 FPS. It looked terrible, and anything resembling a person, a machine, lighting or effects would cause monumental drops to the frame rate, but it did for all intents and purposes actually run. I won't say it ran well, because, I mean, just look at how awful it is, but it did actually work. You can play through Half-Life like this. I guess you could call Unreal Tournament 2003 a contemporary title from the card's launch, 
but even then that is being very generous and mostly lying because this card is two years newer than this game is. Eventually, when running the game in 320x240, we did actually see the game manage to nearly achieve a playable frame rate. It wasn't a good frame rate, mind, because any time you used a weapon that generated a particle effect, which is virtually all the weapons in this game, or you saw someone, because that would also cause your frame rate to nearly drop to single digits, you know, it wasn't the best experience. In, a, in some ways, technically you've got wall hacks, because if you look at someone and your frame rate drops, you know they're hiding behind something. Either way, it looked awful, I could hardly make out what was going on, but with low enough settings, it does actually launch and it does actually run. Now, last time we tested Morrowind on a 3D Phantom graphics card, I said it was the worst I'd ever seen the game look and run while still actually launching. But don't worry, we have a new leader in the worst experience possible with Morrowind, managing anywhere from 6 to 10 FPS with settings that were so low and a draw distance so close that the game was almost completely unplayable. The one thing was with the performance is it tended to repeat itself with what it was doing, so the frame rate and the stutters would just loop like clockwork, so you could almost adjust to when you were expecting a stutter to, be able to, to appear. It was it's ridiculous. So Morrowind was genuinely awful. I don't think I could play it like this, but if you really fancied it, you might be able to adjust to the stuttering. But the big one you've probably all been waiting for, and I have no clue how Valve managed to pull off this many optimizations, that Half-Life 2 actually launched. I mean, it took me a long time to actually get in game, trust me, the amount of footage I have just trying to get the settings low enough down before the game would crash is obscene. But eventually, we got into game, and we got it to boot up with DirectX 6 mode. We had a plethora of low settings used, but we actually made it in the game. I mean, it wasn't great, and we were mostly seeing around 10 FPS for large portions of the game. NPCs' eyeballs and mouths sort of didn't render in properly. Most objects that you walked near appeared from the void, as in they just didn't exist until you got close enough to them, but it did actually run. Really, this makes me want to do some more investigating in the future, as this got me wondering, can you actually tweak Half-Life 2 down low enough? Because I've got plenty of experience tweaking Source games to run well. So could we tweak it so Half-Life 2 will run at 60 FPS with just 8 megabytes of VRAM and whatever awful specifications we have here? I mean, there's a video for another day, as it took long enough just to get this running, but it's given me something to think about. Command and Conquer Generals wasn't actually too great either. Running at 10 FPS in or out of cutscenes and dropping to around half of this if you remotely like the idea of zooming out the world map. This wasn't actually much worse than the slightly better 3D Phantom graphics card we've already tested, which means it was a great success. I mean, not really, but it just didn't perform too much worse than the other one. It looked awful, ran awful, and there's not much you can even do here to make this a redeeming experience. Generals has got a hard resolution cap, and you can't really go much lower than this settings-wise. So, you're just never going to be able to get around this one. Attempting to find a redeeming experience, though, I did load up Unreal Gold which with a slightly okay resolution and medium settings ran all right, but it just looked off. I don't know how to describe it, but this game doesn't look bad with 16-bit color mode, and for some reason, it looks awful here. I can't remember it looking this awful, it's got terrible dithering, an output that looked like half the things that were where they should be were just missing, and maybe it's the lacking VRAM, maybe it's the lacking drivers, maybe it's something I'm missing. But this game should not look this awful with these settings. I mean, these are medium settings in an okay resolution, and it just looks pretty damn terrible, to be honest. So I don't know what's going on here with Unreal Gold, but it runs well, it just doesn't look great. Now, I could go in and test 2D titles, but the output quality here, it really is absolutely horrendous, whether I was looking at it from the monitor or the capture card. At least on the last 3D Phantom card we looked at, it seemed like it was actually okay output-wise. You know, it wasn't anything spectacular, but for a 2D quality, it was fine, and you could definitely say it could pass as a display adapter. And maybe I'm spoilt by the amount of Matrox cards we test on this channel, but seriously, something just looks off when running games or programs or anything. It doesn't matter what you actually have on screen at the time, it just seems like there's something that's off about it. And this is a card from 2005. 
you know, most things at this point were coming with some sort of digital display output. But here we have one VGA port that's hardly capable of giving a quality signal. The PC we're running this on is from that era. It's literally got an SIS graphics card inside, and that output's absolutely fine. But these cards have been put together so badly using such low quality parts that, you know, it just doesn't work properly as even a display adapter for 2D titles. It won't display upwards of 1024x768 without crashing out and giving no display output, and it should support higher. But here, for some reason, it simply refuses and stops working. I've tried different drivers, I've tried a different clean install, I've tried so many different things to try and give the 3D Phantom at least the redeeming chance of being capable of giving a display output of all things, and it simply can't do it. I'd try and find something else redeeming about this card, but it's nigh on impossible. I know some people are going to be saying, and they've already been saying it since I teased the idea of this video coming out, that it's just a display adapter. It wasn't ever meant to game, and I can fully respect that, despite all the gaming related nonsense on the box, because ultimately that's what's selling these to people back in the day, you pick it up on the shelf and you see, oh, it can run DirectX 8, it can't, but the thing is, it hardly functions as a display adapter. Even if we pretend this thing released in the 90s, which it didn't, it struggles with actually launching a display. It, it can't do it well. By the standards of mid-2005, it's downright awful. I mean, a lot of programs, even just trying to launch them, it'll make an API call for a version of the OpenGL or DirectX that it simply doesn't have. It'll lock up the PC, and then you'll have to wait for a mountain of errors to pop up before you can actually get back to using your desktop. And this thing sold for a decent amount of money for a long time. I mean, it launched in 2004, peaked in sales in 2005, and ended in 2008. You know, its best year of sales, it was competing with the Radeon X series, the GeForce 7000 series, and the Matrox Millennium Reboot series. It's not even up against cards like the GeForce MX series, unless you class the MX4000 in that, and even then, the MX4000 is terrible. It is a card that is so awful, it has a 32-bit memory bus. And this card sold for the same price, and makes that look good. I'm struggling to see what purpose this card has other than falling in line with the rest of the 3D Phantom series and having the most egregious advertising ever on the box, hoping that someone who has no clue about cards will pick it up off the shelf and some helpful salesman will say, yes, this thing's amazing, because that seems to be the story of the last 3D Phantom cards we looked at. Just this example is far worse in every way. So there we have it, the 3D Phantom's lowest end graphics card they likely ever made. And just where exactly do my thoughts lie on the matter? Well, it really is the bottom of the barrel. There is little if anything that can make this card redeeming at all. For modern day retro cases, I mean sure, if you really want the experience that something like this offers, and that was considered bad by 90s standards, then maybe you have a use case for it. But back in the day, it did nothing more than what its slightly faster counterpart did, which was to scam people who didn't know what they were actually buying. Sure, it doesn't seem to have the aggressive pricing of the other one, and there don't seem to be as many horror stories, which I'm hoping is because no one actually ended up buying these things. But why does this exist? At best, it's a 90s SIS card that has been re-released for nearly up to a decade longer than it should have been. And at worst, it's a poor example of a card that hardly qualifies as a display adapter, let alone a graphics card. The bundled in CD is so poor that I can't get it to read on any systems. The software that comes with it is more or less useless unless you want to check the specs and make sure that, you know, it has as little power on screen as it does in your hand. And the only good thing is that it works on Windows 95. But then question it. If at this point you've got a Windows 95 machine with an AGP slot, who in their right mind is buying one of these for it? At this point, that is a quality retro machine that is probably worth a decent chunk of money, and you're not going out to buy a 3D Phantom for it. Whether it's 2005, 2025, or probably even 1995, it serves no purpose other than for a painful benchmarking session. I hope you've all enjoyed this little video on the 3D Phantom 2800 XP. I said I'd make a video when I found one, and fortunately I did, still in the box, so now I get to keep this lump of junk. Thank you all very much for watching, and good night.